April 15, 1912, more than 1,500 people die on the Titanic. May 7, 1915, 1,198 die when the Lusitania was torpedoed by a German submarine. December 7, 1941, 1,177 perish aboard the USS Arizona. This is the calculus of catastrophe. But on January 30th, 1945, more perished in one sea disaster than all who died on these tragedies multiplied by three. The Guslov is a tragedy of uh, monumental proportion. History estimates that between six and 9,000 people were lost when a refugee ship, the Wilhelm Guslov, was torpedoed by a Soviet submarine. From this dock, the Wilhelm Guslov, packed with German refugees, set sail. Nine hours later, the ship of hope became a ship of despair. It is a staggering human disaster. Then came the worst moments, the scream of all the people who were still on the boat. Yet what happened remains a mystery. The compartments are flooding, uh, and for all intents and purposes, these people are, are now dead. What happened on that frozen night in 1945? What could doom so many thousands in so short an amount of time? And perhaps... London, England. At this university, there exists a computer program carefully engineered to recreate nightmares. You can just see in the shot, there's a little child here and the child's mother. Its sole purpose, to calculate how and why people die. We've got a uh, middle-aged woman coming down a flight of stairs, and we're noting the way she decides to tackle this corridor. Professor Ed Gallia is an evacuation specialist. His software, Exodus, predicts how people behave in desperate situations. You'd have mass congestion on the stairways, and for all intents and purposes, these people are, are now dead. If this all sounds cold-blooded, it is. But it may help us to bring a forgotten tragedy back into focus. For what is being investigated is a disaster of unprecedented magnitude. It is the story of a ship, packed with war refugees, that ventured out one bitterly cold night into the Baltic Sea. And I hear the scream. And can you imagine in a hull like this, thousands of people still there, and one scream, one scream. These are minutes I will never forget. Terrible minutes. This catastrophe began at the end of the Second World War, as the Soviet army pushed back the Nazi armies who had once brutally occupied Eastern Europe. Germans, refugees, and some troops, fleeing the vengeful Red Army, desperately tried to escape. Thousands packed on board a former cruise ship, the Wilhelm Guslov. Ava Dorn was one of them. The cabins were already double, triple full, so it must have been around 6,000. And then the people came in, many more. They just came in and came and came and came. Ship records listed 7,000 people on board. To put things in perspective, a modern day cruise ship carries 5,000 passengers. The Guslov was built to carry 1,850 passengers. At 9.12 p.m. on January 30th, 1945, just 20 miles from the Prussian shore, the Guslov was struck by three Soviet torpedoes. Within an hour, she was lying on the sea floor. Plunging into frigid 39 degree waters, only 996 passengers survived. It is a conservative estimate that 6,000 lost their lives. This is equal to four Titanics, making the sinking of the Guslov by far the worst naval disaster in history. But amazingly, the scale of the tragedy could actually be much greater. There was increasing unrest on the dock. People were forcing themselves onto the ship. We couldn't hold them back. Sooner or later it would be full and people would be left behind. 
But nobody wanted to be left behind. Why would so many people pack themselves onto a single ship? What fate could possibly be worse than the death they faced that stormy January night? Decades of silence have left the crucial questions of the Gustav's fate unresolved. Over 6,000 people were on board the night the Gustav sank. Why then did only 996 survive? Just how many met their deaths that frigid night in the Baltic Sea? immersed in water as cold as the water that doomed the passengers of the Titanic. And most importantly, could the death toll from this disaster, already conceded by historians to be the deadliest in history, be even higher? Using the technology of the 21st century, Unsolved History's international team of experts will reveal the anatomy of the world's worst maritime disaster. In this simulation, Ed Gallio, evacuation specialist. Nikolai Lookout, computer animator. Jan Urasko, veteran deep sea diver. And naval architects, Mike Bergman and Bill Garski. The tragedy of the Guslov had its roots in the endless winter of 1945, when the Third Reich was living out its last days. Five million Germans were fleeing the Russian army, who now were entering Germany's own East and West Prussia. The brutality that the Nazis had inflicted on the Soviet Union was now being repaid. To be German was to be destroyed. To many, this was, and still remains, justice. The population of East Prussia knew that they were in very much on the front line. They were exposed. They had um, the Soviet troops encircling them all the way around, and they knew that the assault was coming, so there was considerable fear. Adding to the refugees' terror of the Russians was the Nazis' own anti-Soviet propaganda vividly portraying the enemy's brutality. Goebbels, using newsreel footage, warned the whole of the German population in that winter of 1944-1945 of Soviet atrocities when they had attacked into East Prussia. That October, the Russians had recaptured the German-occupied town of Nemersdorf, and the Soviet vengeance was unimaginable. Every woman was systematically raped and uh, children were killed, and uh, it was a form of ethnic cleansing. Obviously, that set the stage for their ultimate disaster in the sands of the Baltic. For two and a half million of these refugees, the only escape was the sea. Their only hope of survival was safe passage on a ship like the Guslov. In May of 1938, the 640-foot Wilhelm Guslov had been launched as the crown jewel of Germany's luxury liners. It was a symbol of an era when a thousand-year Reich seemed to be an inevitability. But within a year, Germany was at war and the Guslov began a new life, serving as a hospital, then a barrack ship, moored permanently in the port of Gotenhofen. Then in 1945, the refugees began to arrive, and the Guslov became the beacon of hope for those escaping the implacable revenge of the Red Army. The ship was made ready to sail again, this time with civilians on board. They said, to have a ticket for the Guslov is half of your salvation. It was Noah's Ark. Guslov's final destination was to be the safe harbor of Kiel in Germany. But instead, she was sunk just 20 miles in nine hours after her departure. The Guslov then disappeared from history. The Guslov just regarded as a, a victory against the German Navy rather than against, obviously, German civilians. German propaganda kept pretty quiet about the sinking of Wilhelm Guslov, as it kept quiet about the whole of the disaster in East Prussia, West Prussia and Pomerania. German war guilt and reluctance to relive the past has kept a shroud over the Guslov's story. 
The victims themselves, they're so traumatized. I mean, they've suffered so much that they very frequently don't want to talk about it. Our investigation will begin not with memories, but with the ship's original plans. In the hands of Unsolved History's maritime experts, they'll provide the first clues in determining the complex physical dynamics of how the ship went down. This ship potentially has a lot of offset or flooding, which makes you wonder why uh, it didn't capsize. What we do to try to reconstruct the sinking is we try to find the scenario that would produce a sinking event as opposed to a capsizing event and we develop a timeline that matched the witness testimony. But an accurate reconstruction of the Guslov sinking will be difficult to create without detailed information about the damage sustained from the three Soviet torpedoes. See here, looks like the forwardmost torpedo hit in the vicinity of compartments two and three. To reveal the truth behind the Guslov sinking, we will have to go to the source. We will dive down into the frigid waters of the Baltic Sea. And then, we will explore a wreck that has been off limits for almost 60 years. The Wilhelm Gustloff sank in 1945, and no one knows exactly what happened, or even how many people died. But history does agree on one point. It was the deadliest single disaster at sea. After just nine hours, the Guslav ventured into enemy waters, where all ships were fair game. She was torpedoed by a maverick Soviet submarine captain, Alexander Marinesco, who, after the sinking, vanished into history, as did the story of the Guslav. Now, Unsolved History retraces her last 20 miles into the icy Baltic Sea. We've secured special permission from the German government to explore her wreck. In order to reconstruct the Guslov's final hour, we must survey the damage looking for clues as to her sinking. Our plan is to uh, find the uh, torpedo holding at the front of the boat. Veteran diver Jan Urasko has been exploring wrecks in the Baltic for the past 20 years. He is the perfect man to lead our exploration of the Guslov. The wreck's location is no secret. It now lays 20 miles off the coast of Poland, 150 feet beneath the surface of the Baltic Sea. Captain, this is Guslov? Yes. Is this the bow? Front? Front, front, yes. But the collective amnesia surrounding this story has made this place a footnote at best in maritime history. No longer. Jan, when you go down, you might want to look for scalloping or dimples in the metal. And if you can find those, you can work your way down, perhaps, and find the torpedo hit. Enduring frigid, 39-degree waters, our divers begin searching for the three vital clues. The three torpedo holes in the port side of the ship. Finding the wreck turns out to be the easy part. But locating the torpedo holes is much more difficult. The poor visibility makes seeing the entire wreck impossible. But every detail our divers find reveals a major problem. The ship is resting on her port side, the side of the torpedo holes and the damaged portion of the hull is hidden beneath the silt and sand. If there is to be any chance of surveying the damage and locating the torpedo holes, our divers must take the very dangerous route through the bowels of the ship. But this pathway proves to be impenetrable. What did you see? Oh, the loss in the middle section of the ship is total destroyed. Did you see any torpedo holes? No, no, not, no. Not it is all broken metal on this side. 
Our footage of the wreck clearly shows surprising damage to the Guslov's hull. Much more than anyone would have expected. Yeah. Yeah, look at that. And it's inside in the ship, yeah. We can at least that moment in the, in the ship ring. So this is the middle, the destroyed section. It's a front part. The ship now lies at the bottom of the ocean. Her center section totally collapsed. This is how she may have looked before she buckled. But what could have caused such total devastation? According to Jan, this damage is too catastrophic to have been caused by the ship sinking alone. He's convinced there was an act of post-war vandalism. Somebody was before us. And they had and a they, purpose. And they completely clean and destroy the ship. We now know one reason why the story of the Guslov has been obscured for so long. After the war ended, a Soviet salvage operation went back, looted, and then destroyed what was left of the wreck. They completely destroy uh, these, these mm. shipwrecks. Looking for, uh, for military documents, archive, documents. Right. Right. golds of, of peoples, yeah. and they completely destroy this ship. Although the Russians obliterated the physical remains of the Guslov, their explosives could not remove her other indelible traces, the memories of the survivors. Can they help us reconstruct what happened? Unsolved History brought together four of the 996 people who survived the sinking. Ava Dorn was 21 years old when she boarded the Guslov. Waltraut Gruder, a member of the Women's Marine Unit celebrated her 21st birthday the day the Guslov sank. Heinrich Corella was just 13 years old when he and his mother were stowaways aboard ship. Heim Schaun is one of the foremost experts on the Guslov. He was also a civilian seaman on that fateful voyage. Sean told us one reason why the final death toll is still in doubt. In the panic of the ship's departure, nobody kept track of how many people were on board. There was a large pile of notebooks which were never copied into the passenger list. That's why everyone thought there was only 6,000 on board, until after the war when military people started to say there were 8,000 on board. Ava Dorn remembers every compartment on the ship being crowded to capacity. But full of people. People slept there on the floors. The cabins, we had, uh, if there were four beds in, there were the eight people in. It was crowded. There must have been at least uh, 9,000, and if you see that. The ship was designed to carry 1,850 passengers and crew. But on January 30th, the Guslov sheltered many thousands more than she should have. This overcrowding made a dangerous situation even worse. When the third torpedo hit, the lights went out and it was literally lifted up into the air. Just as on the Titanic, many families were trapped below decks. There was this pushing and shoving. People were pushed by the masses, fell down, and others might have simply been stepping on them. I saw a woman standing there with two small children and an officer. He shot the children, the woman, and then himself. He seemed to foresee what would happen to us. And the survivors all recall one important fact. The Guslov went down quickly, in just 50 minutes. There was a very slight tilt of the ship. Moreover, there was a heavy sea, and the ship was making movements like this. The bow of the ship went down. The ship went down like this like an arrow, and then it disappeared. And as much as I know, it broke apart, and then it, um, it vanished. And I still see it vanishing. Those who were there that night agree that at least 8,000 were on board. But how reliable are these recollections? Has the tragedy of that night colored their memories? Our investigation will put their memories to the test as we reconstruct the Guslov's final 50 minutes.
The January 30th, 1945 sinking of the Wilhelm Gustloff was an extraordinarily complex event. History is certain on one point. It all began with three torpedoes that struck the port side of the ship. But exactly where did they strike? Our dive showed that the Russians blew up the wreck, perhaps to cover up what happened. Now, almost six decades after the fact, naval architects Mike Bergman and Bill Garsky will reproduce the sinking of the ship in their computer. They will try to create and then sink a computer model in a way that exactly matches both eyewitness accounts and the remaining physical evidence. In order to do this, they will first need to fire three virtual torpedoes at the precise locations that could duplicate the actual events. We basically work backwards. We knew that the ship sunk in 50 minutes, and then we work backward to understand the timeline to get from when the torpedoes hit to when it sunk. The challenge to our investigation is daunting. We must find the precise combination of the three torpedo hits that would sink this particular ship in under an hour. Only then can we calculate the life and death struggle of the sinking. But the question is, can we locate details about a ship that history has forgotten? In Berlin, our computer modeler, Nikolai Lukau, managed to track down several sets of the Guslov's original plans, but they were often contradictory. Luckily, Nikolai found this, a startling replica of the Guslov, exactly as she was as she set sail on January 30th, 1945. Frank Dosher has spent the past 20 years researching the Guslov and has depicted the ship in every detail. His years of investigation have given him a good, but not exact idea of where each of the three torpedoes struck. So, could you show me please where you think the torpedoes hit? The first was struck here at the front on E-deck. Okay. The second in E-deck at the swimming pool. The swimming pool? Okay. The third hit the machine room. So, how do you know where the torpedoes hit the ship? from the survivors who escaped from the machine room through the smokestack. But even Dosher's obsessive research can only go so far as it is based on eyewitness testimony, which might contradict other evidence. Our reconstruction of the sinking requires an exact coordination of all available evidence. Where the torpedo struck is critical to this reconstruction, as the flooding of each compartment would sink the ship differently. Using the ship's original plans and Dosher's replica, we painstakingly created a virtual Guslov, level by level. The ship consisted of three upper decks. There are also five lower decks labeled A through E. These housed most of the passengers. Once this computer model was complete, we sent it, along with the plans, back to our naval architects. To their experienced eyes, these plans reveal critical characteristics of the ship. In the case of the Wilhelm Gustloff, the ship was designed so that any two adjacent watertight compartments could be flooded without sinking the ship. Like the Titanic, this redundancy should have protected the ship, but an iceberg or three torpedoes was something no designer could have foreseen. There was no chance that this ship would stay afloat with three torpedo hits. It was just a question of time before it sank. But how long would the passengers have before the ship went down? And were all those below decks doomed from the start? Before we can answer that question, we must answer another. How much cargo human and otherwise, was the Guslov carrying on that final day. Amazingly, in all of the chaos of those last days, two photographs of the Guslov the morning of her final voyage were taken and survived the war. This is the last known image of the ship before she was struck by the Soviet torpedoes. 
and it does reveal an important clue, but one only the most skilled eye can see. It's really hard to see the draft, but it looks like maybe there yeah. is the uh, draft. It looks like the boot topping. This is the boot topping. Yeah. It's still showing. The boot topping, or the painted line at the bottom of the hull, means little to most of us. But this adds a critical piece of data to our reconstruction. The ship's draft, or her weight, in the water. We're interested in knowing what the draft is before the ship was damaged for several reasons. First, it gives us a baseline to run our model from, and also it tells us approximately where the torpedoes hit. Now, taking our virtual model of the Guslav, and this new data which shows the final weight of the ship, we can estimate the impact points of the three fatal torpedoes. The first deadly torpedo struck the bow of the ship here, between compartments two and three. The second torpedo hit, looks like between four and five. That was a lethal shot because it yes. looks like here on E-deck, there's a crew space in compartment four, and in compartment five is a swimming pool. Anybody down here would have been killed. Over compartment five on the E-deck was the Guslov's indoor pool. Days before, it had been drained to accommodate some of the additional passengers. 400 women marines were jammed into this enclosed space, while Trout Bruder served with many of them. I only know of two women from my unit who survived. From the swimming pool, only two or four managed to escape. The third Soviet torpedo struck compartment number seven, here. It would have been the fatal blow. Mike Bergman can now run the numbers. Beneath the complex string of computations lies the final details that document the last moments of the Guslov. Now, Unsolved History's investigation will bring those numbers to life. First, Mike floods the seven compartments said to have been destroyed by the torpedoes. The computer creates a timeline of the ship's orientation at sea. By adjusting and readjusting these many details, we precisely duplicate the damage, the flooding, and the sinking of the Wilhelm Guslov. This is what the Guslov looked like after five minutes. You can see it will move through the timeline as we go. At this point, water is just starting to build above the sea deck at the bow. Yes. And you can see the bow down trim. And you can see the ship is also healing over a yes. little bit more. The ship continues to go bow down. It continues to heal more to the port side until finally at about 50 minutes. This is the approximate attitude of the ship before it started its plunge to the bottom. This timeline matches the facts to an astonishing degree. Our simulation sinks in 50 minutes, as most survivors claimed. It also matches the Guslov we discovered during our dive at the bottom of the Baltic Sea. But the physical dynamics of the ship's sinking is only one piece of the puzzle. We know the physics of how the ship sank, but what we don't have is the, the human element here. Um, what, what the people did to escape and how quickly they were able to get out of the ship. But there is a way to determine how the passengers escaped. And once we determine that, we can answer the critical question of our investigation. How many men, women and children became victims of the world's deadliest single sea disaster? At 9 p.m. on January 30th, the Wilhelm Guslov was struck by three Soviet torpedoes. And within 50 minutes, sank to the bottom of the Baltic Sea. At least 8,000 people died that night, making it the worst maritime disaster in history. Looks like the third torpedo hit right here in the auxiliary machinery room. Yet despite the testimony of the 996 survivors, no one is sure exactly how many people perished.
But now, for the first time, we can use our compartment-by-compartment -compartment simulation of the ship's sinking to calculate the actual number of victims that died that night. Our eyewitnesses claim that every available space on the ship was used for passengers. If this is true, then we can identify all the open areas of the ship that night and calculate the number of people in each of them and on board. Our careful compartment analysis of the ship's plans places people throughout the ship. Adding those numbers together, compartment by compartment, we arrived at an incredible total. Not 6,000, not 8,000, but a staggering 10,614 passengers. This is a number far greater than anyone suspected. Could the loss of life on the Guslov be this monumental? Is there a way to validate these astonishing results? In London, we discovered a program that could hold the answer. It is the most sophisticated modeling program available. Achieving great success predicting the human behavior in emergency situations in the past. In reconstructing any major um, ship disaster, the first thing we need to do is uh, have the structure, the layout of the vessel. So we, we know where the corridors are, we know where the cabins are, we know where the staircases are, and so on. For our investigation, this information will come from Nikolai Lukau's detailed model of the Guslov. The next thing we have to establish is the scenario. What are we actually going to look at? Which particular what if are we going to study? For example, will there be heel and trim? Will certain parts of the vessel become inaccessible during the uh, disaster and so on? So we have to establish the scenario parameters. This data comes from the timeline created by naval architects Mike Bergman and Bill Garsky. The next thing we have to do is establish the uh, population. How many people were there? Where were the people located? What type of people did we have? We gave Ed Gallia our calculations of the passengers aboard the Guslov. 10,614. Now, the computer program will duplicate the real evacuation, which we know took place over 50 minutes. This program can duplicate with chilling accuracy the behavior of humans in catastrophic evacuation situations. So in Maritime Exodus we use actual data of uh, human performance under conditions of heel and trim. In a specially designed test chamber simulating a sinking ship, subjects are asked to run for their lives. As the ship tilts, human reactions are then analyzed one person at a time. The program's massive computing power takes individual behaviors and combines them into an ordered chaos, predicting how thousands of people will react in a disaster. What you see is the, uh, the colors. And the colors represent the population density. They represent the number of people per square meter that we have in any particular space. Our test is simple. After we perform our computerized evacuation, Will the number of virtual survivors left from our starting number, 10,614, match the number of actual survivors, 996? If these numbers can add up, then our calculus of catastrophe is correct. These are our estimated positions of the passengers at 9.12 p.m., just as the torpedoes struck. People at the front of EDEC, they're actually trapped um, this is uh, the swimming pool area uh, where the torpedoes hit and so uh, essentially these people are either dead or, or they're trapped even at this stage. The simulation then moves the timeline forward. As the water floods the lower decks and the number of people crowding into an area increases, the simulation turns from green, the least density, to light blue through to red, the highest density. You can see now we're getting more densely packed in various locations throughout the vessel. We're beginning to see hot spots developing near staircases. For the Guslov's 5,700 passengers below decks, the staircases are the only way out. 
and they are becoming a death trap. So sind wir das Treppenhaus ins obere Deck. On our way through the stairwell to the upper deck, we had to step over people's bodies. And I remember that I was wondering as a child why these people simply didn't get up and keep on walking outside. Why they didn't get up. As the ship begins to tilt, those who can rush topside towards the upper promenade and the lifeboats. So here we are at uh, about 16 and a half minutes into the simulation. You can see these very red hot areas uh, where we've got massive crowd congestion uh, developing. They're pushing, they're shoving, they're trying to get up the staircases, people being crushed to death. Those lucky enough to reach the lifeboats found they had nowhere to go. You can also see people queuing up on the upper promenade trying to get onto lifeboats. There was a big problem with the lifeboats because they hadn't been swung out to the lowering position. They hadn't done that. In addition, many of the crew essential to lowering the lifeboats were missing since the very first explosion. The first torpedo had ripped a huge hole in the front. The ship was already leaning down in the water at the bow. I knew if water was pouring into the ship, the captain would press the button to seal the bulkheads. And I knew if that happened, I would be trapped, and everyone in the front of the ship would be shut in and condemned to die. Tragically, many of the crew were trapped by the closing watertight doors. The Gusloff now has 20 minutes left to live. This is the upper promenade deck. Um, the vessel is now heeling over uh, over this side, so we've got a very steep angle of heel. These lifeboats are now effectively not usable. The lifeboats on the Gusloff hung from cables and were at the mercy of the ship's orientation. With a heel or tilt of 20 degrees to one side, the boats on the opposite side would crash against the ship, rendering them useless. At 50 minutes, the sea has overwhelmed much of the ship, flooding her hull, dragging her under. You can see on the upper deck, there's, all, there's hundreds and hundreds of people on the upper deck. Effectively, these people will have ended up in the water and they would have drowned. But did our numbers pass the test? Do we now know how many people really were on the Gusloff that night? During our investigation into history's worst maritime disaster, we employed the most sophisticated technology to simulate the sinking of the Wilhelm Gusloff. Beginning with our passenger estimate of 10,614, how many survived our computerized disaster? Will it reconcile with the numbers that we do know, that there were 996 survivors? In this simulation, we're predicting that um, something like 910 people survived. This virtual calculation underestimated the actual number of survivors by just 86 people. Amazingly, our reconstruction and our passenger estimate seem accurate to within 1%. If these figures are correct, a shocking 9,618 men, women and children fell victim to the Soviet torpedoes. There is, however, one question this computer program cannot answer. Why did so many have to die? Why did the hundreds of extra life rafts and vests placed on the ship the day she left fail to save more lives? Some who plunged into the frigid waters were saved despite the freezing conditions by German warships that were in the area. You could feel how your body starts to die in the water. And then suddenly there was an eight-man raft next to me and they pulled me into the raft. They saved my life. A soldier gave me his jacket and life vest. He said we had to jump from the ship into the water before the ship sank and dragged us under. But for every life that was saved, at least nine more were lost. 
The children, that was a macabre thing. Having their life vest around them forced their heads down and their feet were up. Why did these life preservers fail so miserably? Theoretically, we had enough life rafts, but there wasn't anyone there who could have thrown these heavy rafts into the water, and that was a big problem. And there were unanticipated effects of the below zero temperatures. Everything was frozen on the deck, all the rafts and the boats and things like that. Like the Titanic, passengers were exposed to frigid 39 degree waters that left them little chance for survival. Without the protection of a lifeboat, their fate would have been sealed. There were many mothers with three or more children. There wasn't a single surviving mother who had been able to save all her children. Ten lifeboats floated away from the sinking ship and the survivors confronted stark choices as they stared into the eyes of their fellow passengers. Then came the worst moments too, that people tried to, to hold onto the boat and they were hit with the paddles. There is one face which I could paint, which he, he looked at me like, um, you, you can help me, you, you understand me, you can help me. But I couldn't. He must have drowned. Now, we can put the right number of human faces on the tragedy. In the end, more than 9,600 passengers perished that night. The ship of joy had become the ship of death. For those who knew that they still had relatives on deck, they knew that their mother or their children or their parents were on deck. They saw the death of their loved ones. The Guslov tragedy is, uh, is unprecedented in maritime history. We really must look at this disaster and learn the lessons so that hopefully in the future things like this just cannot happen again. Though we do not have the names of all who perished on that January night, we now have a number. The ship itself is not important. So many ships have sunk. It is important to remember the people who drowned, to remind others of their fate. In present day, a maritime disaster of this magnitude would have been remembered throughout the world. The fact that its passengers and dependents were Germans, and the world had little time to mourn their passing. But after all these years, do they not deserve to be remembered? Thousands would die that night because their nation had lost its sanity. In this last calculus of catastrophe, these thousands of men, women, and children allowed their innocence to be erased.